Our next speaker is a very special speaker for us. Um, uh, Justin Capos is a professor at uh, NYU University. The reason why it's so special is because Docker Content Trust and our signing mechanism is actually based on some of his work. So Justin is actually one of the authors of a paper called, a paper called Tough, the update framework, and so we invited him to come here. One fact that I know about Justin is that he really, really likes software update systems. And so help me introduce and welcome Justin Capos. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, so, as I get to do as a professor, I, I also get to take credit for the work that a lot of uh, other people put into this. And it would be remiss of me not to talk about uh, quite a few of them. So, this is work from a lot of uh, current and former PhD students of mine, as well as work by a bunch of full-time developers who I have in my lab who've, who've worked with me. Um, so, uh, first of all, we have a little bit of a quiz here. So, what do all of these companies have in common? They're, they're all major tech companies. Um, they all produce software. Uh, and in all cases, their users have been hacked uh, through some problem that they've had in their software update or their build infrastructure, something that let bad guys get in and stick things that weren't supposed to be inside of um, uh, their software development or build or distribution process and get this out to their users. So this should be a pretty scary list because these are a lot of the you know, major tech companies that, um, you know, that, that we all kind of rely on. So software updates like you know, is a problem. It's happened to lots of different companies. And I, I don't think I have to kind of convince you guys too much that, that this is something that you should really care about in this context because, well, you guys obviously already do care about this in this context, but I do want to point out something, um, which is that this is also something that increasingly gets used by um, very serious, like very cutting edge nation state level actors to do attacks. So one of the most damaging um, cyber attacks that's ever happened is one that people don't talk or think that much about it. But back in, uh, I think it was 2013, South Korean banks and media companies were hit with a cyber attack, allegedly by North Korea that caused uh, almost you know, over three quarters of a billion dollars worth of damage uh, to, to their economy and to their infrastructure. Uh, and when you look at a lot of other things, including uh, let's say we want to go and we want to shut down centrifuges in a country like Iran, um, the flame malware, which was the follow-on to Stuxnet that was uh, in many ways more damaging than, than Stuxnet, which tends to get all the notoriety and credit, was spread through vulnerabilities inside of uh, the way Windows was doing updates. Uh, and, uh, you know, t even furthermore, you look at things like uh, the FBI wanted to get into the San Bernardino uh, shooter's phone, and the big battle they had with Apple was, hey, Apple, why don't you produce the software update that's, gonna dis that's going to um, disable a lot of the security features that are built into the iPhone? So this is something that very serious, like very, you know, nation-state level actors are using increasingly to go after and get into software that they don't have other ways to do. Okay, so why don't, uh, so an idea here is why don't we just like sign things with like GPG or like TLS or something like that? I mean, these things have been around forever. Don't they just solve the problem? And the answer is, well, no. Okay, so TLS doesn't really work um, for a lot of reasons. Uh, one is, uh, you know, really the, the, the biggest problem is, is that it just tells you that you're talking to the, the party that you're trying to talk to. It doesn't tell you that that party hasn't been compromised or that they haven't had some other problem. And uh, so a lot of these companies that I had uh, information on, on the slides earlier on had some repository where they were storing their software, but then somebody just broke into that big complicated web server that's running you know, a lot of software on that system and uh, were able to then go and compromise users. So that doesn't really work. Um, GPG also doesn't really work for a lot of reasons, um, but this is something that at least some um, uh, like some package managers and things have said, oh, this is a pretty reasonable way to do it. It's not a bad start. I mean, you need to sign things, but it doesn't actually um, provide you with a lot of the, the uh, security features that you really want. And one of the big reasons is, is that uh, with the way you're going to, that GPG is, is basically always implemented in these systems, you have a set of keys that are trusted and you have a set of keys that are untrusted. So anytime you ever add any key to that trusted set, first of all, you have to make sure you're adding the correct keys and you're not putting a key in you're not supposed to. And then secondly, when you've done that, then that key is just sort of trusted for everything. Um, and 
if, you know, at least that's the way it's, it's implemented in practice. Now, you can say, well, maybe there's more clever ways to do it, and maybe there's ways to be more subtle about it. And if you, you think long enough about that, then eventually you come up with something that looks a little bit like uh, tough, which is a much, much smarter, uh, you know, we think smarter way of handling a lot of these kinds of issues. It's um, it built on some ideas. We had a discussion with the folks from Tor early on. Um, they came and spent a few, uh, two folks from the Tor project came and spent a few days with me when I was at the University of Washington. And um, we discussed uh, problems that they had in the way they were doing updates and a way that they might try to design a different sort of updater to address those problems. And based on that, they went and they came back to us with a design. And they said, hey, we're going to go live with this thing. Can you take a look at it? And we took a look, and we found eight serious security problems in it, including three that would let any man in the middle compromise their users. And um, we said, wow, this is, uh, this is really bad, because um, you know, this is a really subtle, this is a really challenging problem. So based on that, we went and we designed a system tough that uh, addressed a lot of those issues and is meant to be kind of dropped in. Um, tough itself isn't, uh, one way that people sometimes think about these kind of security systems is it's like this rigid thing where um, if my uh, software update or, or like my build infrastructure and things don't fit exactly along this pattern, then it's not going to work with, with this specific system because it's going to make certain assumptions. And one of our goals in Tough is not to do that. We try to support the workflows and the way that people uh, have with, with working with other systems, the way they do signing, the way they would want to do those kinds of things naturally, and provide them the best support possible, the best security possible in those kind of situations. All right, so um, let me talk really briefly about the design principles for, um, for Tough here. So, there's four basic principles, and I'm going to go through them one at a time and tell you a little bit about what they mean and how they look in practice. So first is responsibility separation. So the idea here is, is that um, rather than just having like a key that is a trusted key, what we want to do is we want to have different people who have different roles within the system, and then uh, so they'll have naturally, you know, they'll have different keys, and those keys can do different things. So for instance, uh, one person might have a key that's trusted to sign a specific uh, package. And another person uh, might have a key, and they might be trusted to know what the latest version of packages are for the repository. And so if the person who's responsible for knowing what version of packages are there tries to sign a package, their signature wouldn't be trusted. And similarly, if the person who's responsible for signing a specific package tried to say, this is the latest version of something, they wouldn't be trusted. Uh, all right. So. Uh, other things you can do with this is you can, uh, I think this is actually pretty much the point I just made, so let me skip that one. Um, that's interesting. Uh, hold on a sec. There we go. Okay. All right. Sorry about that. I went green for a sec. Um, okay. So uh, another idea here is to, in, inside of Tough, is that you want to try to minimize the risk that you have. And so the risk you have with keys is if you have a key that's very likely to be compromised, for instance, a key that you need to keep and use online on a, on a server, um, it's very likely, since that's likely to be compromised, you want the impact of that, that compromise to be low. Uh, and conversely, if you have a key that really needs to be trusted, like it's a key that can revoke trust in other keys, it's like serves as your root of trust, then you shouldn't force that key to be used in a way like an online uh, use of that on your sort of on your web server or something like that. So basically keys that are have a lot of responsibility need to be able to be things that you can, for instance, like um, you know, have as online tokens that you only plug in when you need them. And keys that are uh, that need to be uh, used in an online manner, the amount of damage you can do with a key compromise should be very small. All right. Uh, yeah. And so uh, if you have high impact roles, like the root of trust, then those can be highly secure keys that are stored, at least in many cases, uh, for people who use Tough, it's stored like UV keys that get stored in safety deposit boxes, or at least in locked drawers, um, where online keys can do very little, like just say, oh, there hasn't been an update, when in fact, maybe there has been one. Um, we also have this principle of multi-signature trust. So even within a specific role or a specific action you want to do, Maybe uh, you want to make it so that two people from your team have to go and sign an update for that update to be considered valid. And so um, what uh, Tuff does is it, it lets you support these kind of threshold signatures as part of this. 
And yeah, so A will sign it. If, and if A's key gets compromised here, so if A and B both have to sign it and A's key is compromised, then there's no risk to clients. And this gives you the ability to do things like do key revocation, re revocation other actions like this um, without, uh, without uh, posing a security problem. All right, and then also we have ways of doing implicit and uh, explicit revocation. So explicit revocation, it's pretty obvious that this is something that you want. You want a way, way to say this key is no longer trusted. Maybe it's been compromised or something else like that. Um, but also we have this notion of implicit revocation where uh, like roles and, and keys and other types of metadata expires after a certain amount of time. So if somebody is man in the middle in you and they just uh, refuse to give you any updates over a long period, which uh, you know does um, there? There are a lot of cases where that uh, happens in practice. Um, then you can go and and you can eventually recover from this. And this is something that uh, comes up especially in kind of nation state attackers or governments who don't want their uh, their users to get up to date software. Okay, uh, yeah. So I can skip through that. All right. And so in Tuf, um, there's four basic roles. There's a root role that serves as the root of trust and um, is the one that tells you what the other roles are able to do. It also is most commonly used when you need to do key revocation or at least revocation of the top-level roles in the system. These are all what we call top-level roles. There's something called a targets role, which I'll also show an example in a minute that labels it as projects because the example is from uh, PyPI, and they, uh, because of the way they use it, it, it makes sense to call it projects in their context. This is the role that will go and say things like, um, you know, this is the correct key for this specific package or image or whatever that you want to install. There's the uh, snapshot role, which it tells you that these uh, versions of, of projects were all on the repository at a specific time. And I'll actually show an example about why this is important uh, in a minute. And there's a timestamp role. And the timestamp role just says, has anything been updated? When is the last time something was updated? And it's, it's just meant to um, uh, handle situations, or basically to tell you quickly whether there's been any update at all, whether there's anything new that you might have to retrieve and uh, to, to uh, uh, prevent you from having to go and check a bunch of other metadata to figure that out for yourself. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk about why we need this like snapshot role, because one, one thing that you may be thinking is, well, um, all right, so this timestamp guy, he tells me what's new, and the targets are the things that actually sign the packages I'm gonna install, so why do I need to have this, this snapshot role? Can't I just have just targets and timestamp and everything will work fine? Well, the answer is um, no. Um, so, spoiler, sorry, I spoiled that. Um, but the reason why that doesn't work is uh, due to a few types of attacks. So here's a really basic attack here where, let's say there's some kind of malware, uh, somebody breaks into your repository, there's a bunch of files on here, and uh, they go and they would like to do something like substitute malware. All right, um, well, they can't do this without compromising something like the Django key, but what they can actually do is they can go and they can take old versions of a package, like let's say Django here, and usually, or at least in many cases, the reason why you release a new version is because there's horrible, horrible bugs in the old version that everybody knows how to exploit right now. Um, so you, you have this, this version that you want to make available for compatibility reasons, or you want people to be able to test with it, but you really, really don't want them to accidentally start using this old version. Um, so you want people who try to get the new package to get this. And what someone can do if they go and they break into uh, the repository and uh, you don't have this kind of snapshot role that tells you what the right uh, versions of things you need to install are, what they can actually do is they can go and they can pick any old version that they know how to hack for every single software project that you have on your system and they can tell you these are all the right versions of everything that's on your, on your repository. And when users come and then try to install software, then they will go and they'll get, they'll get hacked from this. And we've seen behavior that um, the way that we, you know, one of the, the ways that we uh, recognize or that this would be a problem is uh, by scraping information from uh, mirrors of a popular Linux distribution and finding that some of the mirrors, uh, specifically two mirrors in a, an Eastern European country, were serving clients uh, certain versions of packages that were years out of date, but serving everything else as though it was completely current. 
So who knows, maybe there was some completely innocent reason like, you know, some weird bug in R-Sync that caused only this to happen for these versions, but um, it seemed pretty suspicious to me. Okay, um, so Tuff has this thing that is now um, uh, in the um, uh, upcoming Tuff 1.0 release where we use a, something called eager verification um, that handles this issue. The snapshot role all by itself handles this, but Tuff, uh, the way Tuff does this is Tuff actually, or sorry, the um, 0 0.1 version of Tuff would eagerly download all of the target's metadata for the entire repository when you would log in and when you would use it. And this actually, uh, to many people, if you just think about this, um, if you have tons and tons of these projects, this can be a big problem. If you don't have very many projects, then this actually doesn't really matter at all. Uh, in terms of efficiency. So something like a Linux distribution can do this just fine. But when you have something like uh, a community repository like RubyGems or PyPI or uh, things like that, then this number of, uh, of uh, um, snap, uh, targets metadata you're going to have here is going to be so large it, and it churns so quickly it's going to cause you problems. So um, what we do is we have uh, something that's in Tuff 1.0 called secure lazy verification, where you actually in the snapshot file, rather than distributing secure metadata about the uh, individual targets, you actually distribute version numbers only about these. And um, this should be kind of frightening to you when you first hear about this, uh, because you were in a situation here where these were secure hashes you were signing of the target's metadata that were then being downloaded and you were attesting to. And you're now going to a situation where you're saying these are the version numbers, but these files would never get downloaded until the targets themselves were supposed to be installed. Okay, and after uh, kind of a lot of analysis, what we figured out is, is that um, this actually prevents replay attacks just as effectively as the other technique does um, and does so much more efficiently. What it does is it's kind of this um, interesting situation where, um, so the reason, so this actually prevents the same sort of attacks, but it opens you to a new type of attack called a fast forward attack. Where what you can do is you can add, uh, you can make version numbers so large that there's no, that the people who are producing the software are not gonna use like 5,001 or whatever numbers you stick in here as your next version number. And as long as you handle this kind of attack, this fast forward attack, um, then it, you can actually get exactly the same uh, security guarantees you get otherwise, but you can make the system much more efficient. So it is as secure um, as long as you handle this uh, fast forward denial of service. And it's this kind of interesting situation where by making the common case of the system, um, which is that it's not compromised, we can make that much more efficient by doing something much more complicated when you have a compromise, which is a rare situation. So you guys are all, I'm sure, used to that in your own engineering, is make the common case fast, make the uh, corner cases correct. Okay, um, so I, I just, uh, after teasing that a little bit, now let me tell you a bit about um, how Tuff gets set up and, and uh, how it might get used in practice. So this is an example here. So the green keys are keys that are kept offline in a drawer somewhere. Um, and the red keys might be kept offline, online uh, on a server somewhere in some situation. This is one example. It's not a particularly secure one because this key that's used to sign packages is actually kept on a server somewhere. Um, but within here, you have, uh, uh, you have responsibility separation because you have these different roles. Um, you can have multi-trust uh, signatures. And um, furthermore, you can also do this thing, selective delegations, uh, which I'll skip forward uh, to and talk about. So, uh, so this is the, you know, so you can use Tuff in a way that's flexible and uh, supports a lot of different use cases. And the example I'll show here is an example actually about, um, that's been standardized for use within Python, where this is the way that they delegate things off of their uh, targets. This is, these are the way that they delegate to their projects that are being used on their community repository, where they do so, and they do so with a mix of delegations to online and offline keys. And the interesting property this has is, is that if somebody breaks into the repository, they can only um, uh, manipulate or mess around with projects that are extremely new. So if someone goes and they registered a project in the last few weeks or something, um, their users might be at risk. But from what we've seen from looking at PyPy, 
uh, PyPI, then over 99% of the users who come to the repository only download uh, packages that are, are more than a month old. And so um, even if you have somebody break in the, into their repo and stay undetected for an entire month and be able to change anything they want, then most of their users are still safe. Okay, so um, I've talked a little bit about what Tuff is and where it is now. Um, we've been getting a lot of really good suggestions from uh, uh, different people in, well, you know, the Docker community and um, CoreOS and Ruby and Python and elsewhere, um, Haskell and, and so on. And so uh, uh, to help to kind of codify this and make sure everybody knows what's going on with Tough and how it's going, we now have a formal uh, augmentation proposal process. So if you want to go and you want to say, hey, we want to make this change to Tough, then um, we, will, uh, we have a process now for doing it other than just sending an email and then waiting for it to somehow appear in the code base and seeing if it comes in. So there are a few different uh, taps that are already uh, e you know, in progress uh, on, on their way to being approved. So there's one that handles multi-role signatures that's done by uh, Evan and Jake at uh, CoreOS. And um, this is a, a change so that Alice, you can now say inside of Tough that Alice and Bob both have to sign a package. And they're especially interested in this because they want to have situations where they can have um, these kind of uneven quorums where like one person from the, the, this team has to sign and one person from this other team has to sign. Um, but you can't have two people from one of the two teams sign, for instance. And you can, you can say this now once you have this feature. Um, we also have this ability, uh, tap four is adding the ability to pin repository keys. So you can have effectively multiple um, roots of trust. You can say, this part of my namespace all uh, comes from Docker Hub, and this other part of my namespace is going to come from um, some other repository, some other source. And the exciting thing about this is that now, even if somebody goes and compromises your root keys, it doesn't necessarily mean game over for you, um, because you can uh, have users that have kind of segregated out their trust. Uh, there's also, uh, yeah, there's a few other changes here that, that have been proposed, like specifying the URLs of the repository and root files. Uh, David Lawrence has uh, recently uh, um, given us a proposal to put version numbers in root metadata, which is one of these like things that's like, why haven't we been doing this the whole time? Um, so yeah, we're uh, excited to do this. And there's also been a discussion with a lot of folks here about interesting um, having some kind of ability to chain pieces of timestamp metadata together so that you can do some auditing and things later. And I've been thinking a lot about this problem in a different context, and I'm excited to talk about that because I think that's going to be a nice addition to Tough once we hammer out a few details. OK, um, so there's some integrations that have been going on. Um, and you know, these are really thanks to a lot of um, you know, hard work by you know, a lot of people in this room and a, a lot of our other collaborators. Um, it's just really too many people to, to name, but you know, we are very appreciative and um, you know, love working with all you guys. So um, you know, yeah, let's, uh, let's continue to make uh, Docker and everything else great. So uh, I want to talk very briefly about two other things that I have going on, just to kind of give you an idea about uh, what's happening with Tough and how we're starting to look at different problems and what we're expanding out into. Um, I hope both of these are at least a little interesting to you guys. Uh, so one is, is that we have this thing, Uptane, that is, uh, we've been generously um, uh, asked and funded by the Department of Homeland Security to try to fix this huge mess that is cars, uh, doing updates for cars. Um, if you, uh, so I know some of you listening you know, to me talk very quickly about all the stuff with software updates are sitting here thinking, gosh, you know, I'm going to sleep well tonight. Um, if you don't want to sleep well tonight, then I can tell you about why you should be scared of cars, like, everywhere. Um, okay, so there's, uh, we've been working a with a lot of the U.S. car manufacturers. The, the last meeting we had, we had um, over 75% of the cars on the road. We had representatives from uh, those car companies in the room with us working through this. And, uh, huh? And, yeah. And so um, what we've done is we've come up with a design I'm not really going to talk too much about, but we're, uh, we've currently gone and um, uh, basically implemented this. This is together. We're doing a demonstration in a few weeks of this. Um, and uh, this is something that's been fast-tracked through the standardization process. So hopefully, because automakers are actually on about a five-year life cycle for cars, 
Um, it's going to take a little while for this get, before this gets out in the road, but we, are, um, we do have a, a version working on the ECUs in cars and uh, that, you know, um, that you can go and, and hack on. Um, we are, by the way, making this entire thing uh, public. In fact, some of what we have is already public. There's going to be a big like, kind of media push in a few months, and we're going to be soliciting for anybody who's at all interested in the security community to take a look at this and point out any problems we have to do so because this is very likely uh, going to be, um, it looks very likely this is going to be in your car five years from now. And so we want you, if you find some clever problem, to find that before it gets in your car, okay? Um, which is the way you would think they would do this in the first place, but it's not at all the way it's done. Um, and uh, yeah, and so I've also been working with a lot of folks in uh, the healthcare and uh, a lot of other types of infrastructure. So um, yeah, you, you, yeah, I can tell you things about elevators and pacemakers and stuff like that too that you don't want to know about. Um, okay. So uh, finally, now this one I think is going to be of a lot of interest to a lot of people here because uh, I've heard different chatter about people starting to think in this direction. So um, tough really only solves part of the problem. It basically helps you go from the, the version, you know, the, the moment at which you've completely packaged your software into a package and you're ready to get it to, to then transit it to your clients. So tough really only handles that part of the process. And the idea here is, is that there's a lot more to the software supply chain. So you know, you use your editor, you go, you um, um, you commit it into a version control system, it, uh, that gets you know uh, built and tested, and and uh, then it gets packaged, and then it gets sent off. So could we secure the entire software supply chain? Could we go and make it so that if people break into different parts? Um, you know, they're, uh, uh, we can protect them. So, and this happens a lot. So Apple had uh, people break in Linux, blah, blah, blah. You know, I could, I could go through and, and give you like a few dozen examples of situations where people broke in, not necessarily to the end distribution part, but actually broke earlier in. So let's say you have something like you have a Git repo and you go through and you use Gradle and then eventually you deploy it using Docker. So we want to secure all of this. We want to secure... Um, these individual components to so the best we can, and we want to secure the kind of linkage between them. So that in the end, when you go to download a piece of software, you see something and you're able to say, huh, okay, this software, huh, this was built, um, uh, so Microsoft told me that, you know, that they were going to build it using their developers and that they work, um, that the team of developers had five people on it and every code, uh, every piece of uh, code had to be reviewed by at least one other developer before it was merged into master. And then they, you know, out of this, they had to run it through, uh, you know, this integration testing system, and they had to run it through this build system, and they had to do this, and they had to do that. And look, it passed all of these steps. It went through all these steps, and all these steps were correctly performed. So that's that's really the um, the idea behind uh, Toto. Um, and so the... Uh, there's a person called a project owner here, and they basically say, this is the layout. This is the thing I was just describing to you. This is the set of steps that you're supposed to go through in the way that all the people are supposed to act in the system for the thing to be secure. Um, and then there are these people called functionaries. And functionaries are the people who actually provide, uh, you know, do the, the steps. This is the developer who goes and makes a commit. Or this is the person who's running the build system. Or this is the automated script that uh, runs the integration tests. And they go and they sign individual pieces of link metadata. And then at the end, the user goes and they download what we call a final product. And this final product contains the normal thing you think of as a package, but also contains uh, this metadata here. And then with this information, the end user is able to actually validate that, yes, this layout um, was followed and all it went through all the right steps. Somebody didn't sneak in the middle and stick a backdoor into your Juniper router or, or you know, just to throw a random company name and, you know, not, not that that would ever happen. Um, okay, right. Um, so here, you know, uh, I'm going to go through and I'll actually show you a demo in a sec where we have, um, uh, because I have 10 minutes, do I have 10 minutes? Okay, good. So I'm going to show you in a demo in a sec. So we have Alice and Bob um, that can commit to the version control system. Um, and actually, I'm not going to do it using Gradle and so on, unfortunately. Uh, but anyway, so yeah, here's the, the end result is that you go, you get the container, you get the um, link metadata, the layout metadata, and you can validate all this. 
Um, how much time do I really actually have? I really? Okay, okay. So yeah, so I'll, I'll show a quick demo of part of this. You can see this. Um, I want to say that most of this code didn't exist uh, like about a week and a half ago. So yeah, um, so this is going to be a much more exciting demo uh, than the tough demo would be, where I, I feel like you know it's going to work and everything's going to be perfect. Uh, and I need my little cheat sheet here too. And OK. All right, so um, here I, I have a, um, so here uh, I just have a couple of directories set up uh, on, on the system. And I'm going to go in and first do some action. So remember, the project owner is the one who needs to set things up in the system. So uh, I go in here, and I just have a blank uh, directory. What I'm going to do is just run a script to just kind of set up some information here. So this is going to create um, the overall metadata for me, which I'll show you, because I think uh, this is part of what you really want to see here. Uh, so I'm actually going to skip down a minute here. So here um, we have the rules that we're going to go through and do about how the way that the software is supposed to be um, uh, created. So it's expected that uh, Alice, uh, who's the first person here, this is Alice's key, uh, is uh, going to run VI to create her software, and she's going to create a file called foo.py. And then after this, Bob is going to package it, um, and Bob's key is here. So he's going to run this package step, and then his step is going to be to tar it up, and he's going to use a command that looks something like this in order to do it. And then that's it. And then Alice and Bob are going to package it up, and then in the end, um, when we go to verify it, then we have this set of rules up here that tells us exactly how to uh, validate it uh, in the end. It tells us how to unpack it and exactly what to do to make sure that nothing was tampered with. OK, so what we've done is we've generated Alice and Bob's keys. Um, I'm going to we uh, I'm going to copy these over into a directory functionaries here, um, which is where I'm going to have Alice and Bob perform their actions. So uh, sorry, now is where I need to cheat because I have to type this pretty long uh, command in here. Total run name. So now um, Alice is going to do the write code step, and this step is going to produce a file foo. And it's going to sign everything using Alice's key. And we're going to run vi on create a file called foo.py. So I can create this uh, very simple file here. Uh, and so what has happened? Well, what's actually happened is I've also, uh, in addition to running vi, I've also created this link metadata here for this step. And this has said, hey, um, you just created this thing uh, foo.py. It has a, a foo.py that came out of this, had a specific hash, and there was no standard error, standard output from this. And uh, the VI returned successfully. So it's saying, like, you've actually gone through and, and done, the, done the right steps. Uh, like, VI uh, did the right thing, and it's capturing what occurred. So now we're going to go through, and we're going to have Bob actually go through and package everything. So Bob is going to uh, use as a material an incoming thing, foo. And uh, Bob is going to create a file, uh, foo.tar.gz. He's going to sign uh, the metadata about it using his key. And so there we go. So now he's gone, and he's also created a piece of metadata here for the package, which looks very similar to what we had before. It took in foo.py and produced this package. OK, and then out of that, what we can do is we can go and um, copy the foo.tar.gz, uh, both of the link files from here, and we go into the project owner directory and copy the root layout. And in my example here, Alice is actually the, um, the uh, project owner. So we put this in the final products. And then if we've done this all correctly, um, and there are no uh, bugs in, my, in, in the code here, uh, fresh off the press code, fresh out of GitHub, uh, then if, uh, right, then what we should see here is a bunch of output that says passing and zero. OK, good. So everything works. So the, the, thing, um, you know, the layout wasn't tampered with, and everything worked correctly. 
and I'm not going to show you in the interest of time, but if I went through and I tampered with one of these steps, you would see it go up and tell you that there's an exception here, and I would the system would error out when trying to do this. Okay, so um, to summarize, it's not easy being green. Yeah. Okay, so here's where we're at with, uh, with uh, Toto. So we have a high-level spec that we think is basically approved. Um, we're, we're doing some internal things, and then we're going to release it more publicly. We do have a reference implementation that does some things, and is, um, uh, it, but is very uh, welcome for anybody to hack on. And really, all of our code is welcome for you guys to hack on, just like talk with us about it, let's do things. We're going to start using it internally, um, inside of a bunch of our uh, projects like uh, Seattle and, and Tough and other things in the next few weeks. And we're going to do a very, um, uh, be asking people who we know, which will be some people in this room, if they'd be willing to try it out and test it internally, um, you know, in the next month or so. And then after that, we'll have a big uh, hullabaloo about it and say, hey, this is, you know, the next great thing. Everybody should uh, be doing this because otherwise nobody knows what actually is in your software. Uh, Okay, so to wrap up, um, securing software is a hard problem. Um, the notary folks are, uh, have done really a very good job with this, um, with Docker containers. And um, you know, we're very uh, pleased to, to work with them. They've been great. Um, so if you're interested in making changes to Tough or understanding more about this, then the TAP process is a good way to do this. Let's uh, have a quick email discussion or Skype discussion. And then if that makes sense, then we can do a, t a TAP write-up um, maybe together. Uh, and our software for all these projects is available on GitHub, so we'd love to have your uh, forks, pull requests, stars, things like that. Um, and with that, I'll take any questions. Yes. There were two questions, actually, I forgot the first one. The, fir the second question is related to your most recent slides about Alice and Bob. So when Alice is forced to do VI, uh -huh. foo.py, something. Oh, yeah, so, OK, so, so, so let, let's say that Al, uh, can, if we can use, OK, so one thing that in my example, so for simplicity, Alice was also the person who um, was the project owner which usually you wouldn't want to do that. You'd want to have Alice herself would have different keys. But let's say the, the person who's going and creating the, the software is malicious, right? Yes. So the way that this layout was set up, this layout was set up saying it was OK for a single developer to uh, produce the software. Because this layout said Alice alone is able to go and without any supervision add changes to the software, this is, an, this is correct and will pass and say it's OK. Now, the layout instead could say that there's multiple developers, like Alice and Charlie. And Charlie has to review all of Alice's changes and uh, decide whether or not to merge them into master, right? Um, so if you set it up that way, then presumably Charlie would catch this. So we're not trying to say that it's not possible to do things, but we're trying to take the procedures. Like Many companies already have these kinds of procedures in place. You don't just get to commit stuff to master and then just like you know, make packages and put them, you know, make containers and put them out to all users. In many cases, I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to judge. Um, so we're trying not to be judgmental, but we're just trying to say that if you have something where you actually have those procedures in place, which would catch it, then we want to make sure that we are cryptographically checking you know, the signatures that you should be putting on, you know, making you put signatures on things you do, and then checking to make sure that it actually went through all those steps. All right, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Hi. Hi. Uh, I mean, I, w I have just a comment regarding the, the procedure. Over there, you showed that, uh, OK, the, the developer is um, using VI, later on it's supposed to do use OTAR. But uh, what guarantee you that VI, OTAR are not uh, already compromised, for that, instance, or the compiler yeah. is not compromised? That, that is an absolutely excellent question for a whole bunch of reasons. Okay. Um, 
I almost feel like I have to take this to the boss session because it's such a good question. But I, I'll, give you, I'll give you the answer I thought was right uh, a month ago. And then uh, I'll have to give you the real answer offline. I trusted the platform. I can only think well, about that. Well, you, you can, but um, you, can, you can do things like, you know, um, you, you can have a t an environment or a platform that you have a reason to have more trust in. Now, whether you believe, like, in that TPM is the solution to all trust problems in I systems. I don't believe that. No, no, yeah. But, you know, there are people who think that that it at least gives you better guarantees um, and at least gives you more control over what happens. So, once again, we're not trying to say it isn't possible for somebody to get in, but if they had to get in and had to get in through TPM and through, you know, uh, you know like, like make all these other parts of the system uh, be tricked, then that actually does give you much better guarantees than you would have without it. Does that make sense? Yeah, makes right. sense. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you.